Well, what a pleasure to welcome you here today. I must say, it's also a great honour for me to be with you all. Today's talk is in three parts. And the first session is about material discoveries. So I'll be the storyteller. There's, uh, it's, it's simply sit back and relax. But part two, we do a deep dive into the meaning of what was discovered and what it means for the individual. And then uh, session three is all about a project and bringing, if you like, material discoveries and matching it with some values. And it's a project that's dear to my heart. So uh, let's start about uh, the material discoveries. But we're just going to um, begin with a couple of principles. And these are free will. I wanted to mention free will because it's respected throughout the universe, basically. Every um, person, their free will is honoured and it's something that we should remember when we are engaging with other people. So today, if I suggest anything, you have free will to do it or not. Now, This is, this is interesting. All human beings have the ability to discern truth. Now, it's not an ability that's connected to any amino acid chain in your DNA. It's actually a spiritual endowment which comes as part of your personality. Now, it's distributed, this endowment is distributed equally to all people of all generations. So everyone has the sensitivity to discern truth. And today, I'd like you to dial up your sensitivity. So, um, okay, next point. Are we accidents or are we here with purpose? And basically, this is the crux of the talk. It's, it's like the framework. And obviously, I'm going to take the path of describing purpose. Now, purpose is a word that could be um, substituted for meaning. So what's the meaning of life? And this is, after giving it a little bit of thought, I can divide it into two parts. One, you're experiencing life. That's it. That is the meaning. You, you are here, you are experiencing, you're in your body. That's the meaning. But there's a second half to it. And the second half is to become one with the divine within and above. That is the second half of the equation. Now, 2,000 years ago, a man, and I'll use that word emphatically, a human man, demonstrated what you can do with human potentials in expressing the full meaning of life by putting in a huge effort in attuning himself to the divine within. And we're going to dive into that in session two. All right. This is interesting and I'll try to be as quick as possible. A prayer generally has some sort of self-interest. You ask for something. You, know, you say a prayer, I say, I'd like this or solve this problem. Or you might move into worship and you're just in a state of gratitude and grace. But I tried something very different a few years ago and I couldn't describe it until yesterday a name came up called the flip prayer. Now, what's a flip prayer? The flip prayer 
is basically where you put a request node. You make time available, unconditional, and this is the beginning of my journey. I made time available. I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't worshipful. I was very casual. And I made three weeks available. I had a certain amount of funds. And I basically said, all yours. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll go anywhere, travel anywhere on the globe, carry out any task. It was very casual. I didn't expect anything to happen. About 10 days later, the phone went and I had an invitation to go to Mexico to do a 10-day workshop, shamanic workshop. Very interesting. Two days after that, I had another invitation to visit the Pitninjara tribe in Central Australia to learn about secret men's business. Very interesting, a great cultural experience. Then 24 hours after that, I received another invitation to visit Sai Baba in India. Now, Sai Baba is a well-known guru in India and has done a lot of great social work and is renowned for manifesting all sorts of minor miracles like his divine ash and divine nectar and so forth. Anyway, and in a bit of a dilemma, I went to my good friend Trevor Jones here, <laughs> who owns Hawthorne Travel, and I said, Trevor, where would you go? I've got this dilemma. And he sits in his chair, you know, and he sits back and I hear the brain, you know, the turning over and then all of a sudden one word pops out. He goes, Jerusalem. And I jumped. I said, that's it. And he leans forward. He goes, not going to send you. I said, come on, come on. Just book me a ticket. He said, no, I'm not going to send you. There's an intifada. There's a war going on in Israel. I said, don't worry. So after some arm twisting, a little bit of bribery or promise of a bottle of wine, he booked me a ticket. Next thing I find myself in Israel, handing my passport to the uh, immigration officer, and I asked for a, a slip, not a stamp, but a slip, because I wanted to visit some other countries. The slip raised some attention with the immigration officer. Anyway, I get my passport, I step in, and I'm surrounded by two security guys, and I'm taken to a room, put in the room, and in this room there's one stainless steel table. He said, wait here. Five minutes later, my bag turns up, it's put on the stainless steel table, the, the officer walks out. Ten minutes after that, a military officer walks in, a young female, and she says, please open your bag. So I open the bag. She says, why are you here in Jerusalem? I said, I'm a tourist. She said, there are no tourists coming to Israel. Sorry, Tel Aviv. She said, why are you here in Tel Aviv? And I said, well, I'm a tourist. And she said, no, don't buy it. She said, who are you meeting here? I said, no one. Where are you staying? I said, don't know, don't have a hotel. Have you booked a car? No, I haven't booked a car. And the questioning went on. And instead of the questioning to being a straight line, it turned into a circuitous route. And it turned into a type of interrogation. So she's unpacking my bag, going through everything, till she came to the last item in the bag, which was a male cylinder, about a metre long. And she said, what's in this? And I said, maps. And she said, they're not tourist maps. They're too big for tourist maps. And I said, have a look. So she opened up the mail tube, rolled out the maps, and she said, these are high-definition contour maps. What's going on? And I said, look, if you look at where they're all, they're all about the old city in Nazareth. I'm here to study the geography of Nazareth. And she, go, he, she goes, oh. And then all of a sudden the story fell into place. And she said, you're free to go. I turned up in Nazareth late, about four o'clock, and I had nowhere to stay, right? So I'm in Nazareth and I could not find a bed for love and money. I thought the hotels would have been open, but everyone was closed. So I bashed on the door of a particular hotel for about two minutes. And then about two floors up, the shutters of a window opened up 
this man stuck his head out of the window and he goes, we're closed, can't you see? And I said, look, I'm desperate. I've been traveling for 30 hours. I need a place to stay. And he hesitated and then he said, look, if you walk up this road a little bit more and turn left up the alleyway, go up about 200 yards or 200 meters and you'll see the entrance to a convent. And I knocked on a door, I told them my situation, they let me in, and this is what confronted me, which is the entrance to the convent. And it was so peaceful. I had, I, it was like stepping into another realm. So, I went to bed, next morning, I get up, walk down to the breakfast room, one place setting, unrolled my maps, and the sister comes up and says, cup of coffee? And I said, thank you. And then she said, hmm, they're not tourist maps. And I'm going, I've heard that before. And she says, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I sort of just want to get a feel of where the house of Jesus might have been 2,000 years ago. Now, why was I travelling with contour maps? Here's a quote from a book. The home of Jesus was not far from a high hill in the northern, northerly part of uh, Nazareth, some distance from a village spring, which was in the eastern se uh, section of town. The family dwelt in the outskirts of the city. The home was located a little to the south and east of a southern promontory. Okay? Uh, about midway between the base of this elevation and the road leading um, out of Nazareth. So, I was able to do some basic triangulation. And I spent the day um, walking, taking compass readings and so forth. Now, the second morning, I get up, I go down and the sister says to me, how'd you go yesterday? And I said, well, you know, I've narrowed it down to 500 metres by 500 metres square. I think it was something somewhere in this area. And she goes, look, since you're really interested in archaeological sites, under the convent we have a dig going on. And she said, would you like to have a look at it? And I go, oh, it'd be terrific. So we walk down this hallway and we come to a bit of uh, some steel iron gates at the end of the hallway, gets the big old key, opens up the gates, and there's a marble staircase leading under the, under the convent. And so I thought, oh, this is interesting. At the first level, we come to, uh, she said, look up. And there was a Crusader dome, which was built about a 1,000 years ago. Just a small cupola, like, um, but very nice. I said, oh, that's interesting. And then we walked down another flight of stairs and we came to a little alcove where there was uh, some sort of religious ceremony that had happened. And they dated it to about 300 AD. So... The site is under, that window looks down into the dig. Now, we went further and we found ourselves in a first century home under the convent. And this is where I was standing. This is the doorway to a first century home and I was suitably impressed but I suffered from tunnel vision and I said to the sister, look, I've really got to go and finish my mapping. And she looked at me somewhat quizzically, like just sort of, okay. And I left and I went to do the rest of my mapping. That night, I go to bed and at two o'clock in the morning, I just woke startled. I woke up and I thought, I've made a mistake. And I'd taken the north drop line, if you like, from the top of the hill, from the wrong spot. Because I remembered I'd seen a dam, a reservoir, and they always put the reservoir at the highest point of the hill. And I'd originally t taken the drop line from a, a big school that's up there, a big college on the, on the rise. And when I moved the line and I dropped it down into the old city, well, it crossed with the lines from Mary's well and right on the promontory 
at the site where I was staying in the convent. Then I realised that the home was the site under the convent was the home of the Holy Family. So I was awake for two or three hours and then at 5am when the sisters went to prayer, I'm there in the courtyard and I'm all excited and all excited and I'm going, do you know what you've got here? You know, like, seriously, look, it's a perfect match. And they just smiled. They did not say a word and they went off to the chapel and they had their morning prayers. Well, this began a, this began a story. Okay. Another bit of evidence why I think the home is the home or the site. The only real accident Jesus had up to the time was a fall down the backyard stone stairs which led up to the canvas roof bedroom. It happened during an unexpected sandstorm from the east. Now you're probably saying, where am I getting this information from? I always like to check my sources of information. A lot of people would know about the Arantia book. A lot of people don't know about the Urantia book. It makes a lot of statements, particularly about the life and times of Joshua ben Joseph, a.k.a. Jesus. Joshua ben Joseph as a man. Stone stairs. They were the stone stairs that he tripped down. After I realised it was a home, I spent five days photographing the entire site. The sisters gave me carte blanche. I, I photographed every stone, took measurements, um, did some research on the history of the place. Then I found out an archaeologist by the name of Father Senes had been there in the early 1950s and he'd written quite a quite a lot of reports. Now, I decided to go and look for these reports and I went into all the Jerusalem libraries and there was the card of Father Senes but when I would go to the shelves all the documents were missing, library after library and I went to the Ecole Biblique, one of the most prestigious and secure libraries in Jerusalem and there was the card in the drawer, Father sent us the, the uh, archaeological notes of the Sisters of Nazareth, missing. And I heard, I heard, that the only way documents can disappear or move or be moved from uh, such a library is by instruction from the Vatican. Could be true, I presume so. It's a very highly secure library. It's only for academics. So the plot thickens. Who wants to hide the location of this home? So after a few years of searching, I found out through the sisters that there'd been a visitor from the Vatican by the name of Father Livio. So I spent quite a bit of time tracking down Father Livio and eventually caught up with him in Geneva and I was with my colleague Neil Franci and we had a meeting with Father Livio and we asked him, he actually asked us, he said, why are you here? And we said, we're looking for the research notes of Father Sanus and he leant back in his chair and he said, they are very, very difficult to find. And we go, we know, we've searched every library and can't find them. And he goes, hmm, he said, wait. A quarter of an hour later, he comes back with a library trolley of documents. Father Livio slid across the table all the research notes of Father Senes. Then he slid across the table all the references that went back to 300 AD. And then I found out he trained as an archeologist, so he had provided his opinion of the site 
and provided those documents. So there were three big piles of documents sitting in front of Neil and I. And he said, you're welcome to copy them. That was an extremely generous gift from Father Livio. We took all the documents, Father Livio departed. We took, put all the documents back on the library trolley, pushed them down a the hallway, and then we came to a landing. And at the end of the landing, my jaw dropped. And Father Livio's, uh, Father Livio's secretary, Yvette, whispered in my ear, she said, you are looking at 50,000 religious texts because in front of me was three floors of library books and down on the lower floor I could see a team of librarians. One of the biggest collection of religious texts ever. Extraordinary. So we copied the texts and here's a, a shot, a photo of all the documents, piles and piles of documents of Father Senes, other works, there's also a PhD work of uh, some people from Canada who did the study of the site. So you can see there are a lot of documents all supporting the conclusion that I came to from a different path. A few years after I had um, come to the conclusion that this was the house, the sisters appointed Professor Ken Dark from Reading University to conduct a professional archaeological study of which he probably nearly spent a decade and only just recently published his book. This is his book of, the, of his work and it's basically a confirmation of what I've told you. He also used a lot of the reference material of Father Senes and the work that uh, Father Livio handed across. So it's a bit of a teamwork. Now the reason why this is controversial is that the, the Roman Catholic Church has built a huge basilica in Nazareth stating that they've got the site. So it's controversial. Now Professor Ken Dark has more or less said he believes it's the home, the holy home. Then the story really gets cooking. Because in 2003, a very good friend of mine, Mark McBurney, wanted to visit Nazareth. And I said, look, let's meet in Heathrow, because he was visiting family up in Scotland. And um, we'll, we'll go to Nazareth, I'll show you. So in 2003, Mark McBurney and I flew to Tel Aviv on an overnight flight. Now, I say that with some caution because something happened. So our plan is to go to Nazareth because Martin wanted to have a look at the site. Now when we got on the plane I said to Martin, look, why don't we call past Jerusalem? I said it's a fantastic city. It's really vibrant, it's you know it's got a lot of colour, there's so much going on. And he goes, I don't want to do grotto hopping in Jerusalem. And I thought, fair enough. And I said, really? You've travelled all this way and you don't want to just swing by for a day? No. So I tempted him. I said, look, we have some information about where the tomb of Jesus might be. How would you like to go looking for it? He said, oh, really? And I go, I go, yeah, come on, come on, you know, get into it. He said, I'll give you eight hours. I said, eight hours? You want me to look, you want me to do an archaeological search in eight hours? He says, yeah, look, I just have a look around, you know. I said, oh, okay. So then we fall asleep on the plane. It was an over, overnight flight. We get into Tel Aviv at 5am, catch a bus up to Jerusalem. We stay in the... Uh, 
Mount of Olives Hotel, which is a great place. It overlooks the old city. It's magnificent, magnificent. 5 a.m. in the morning, we can't sleep. We both put on our walking shoes and head down through Gethsemane, down Mount of Olives, up through St. Stephen's Gate and into the old city. Now, from a quote from the Urantia book. They decided to bury Jesus in Joseph's new family tomb, hewn out of solid rock, located a short distance north, north of Golgotha, across the road leading to Samaria. The tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, a very good friend of Jesus and his family, the tomb was in his garden on a hillside on the eastern side of the road and also facing towards the east. They carried the body into the tomb, a chamber of about 10 square feet. So, we knew roughly where the tomb was. The planted thought. Now, this is interesting. And this is where you have to use your sense of what is true. Because when I was standing at the carousel getting my luggage in Tel Aviv with Martin, and we we're about to get on a bus to go from Tel Aviv up to the hills into Jerusalem, I say to Martin, do you know I had dinner with Urs Rukti? I'll tell you about Urs Rukti in a moment in Paris, it was two days before I met Martin, and I said, Uz Rukti told me the tomb is 800 metres north of the Damascus Gate. So he gave me a distance. And Martin goes, really? I said, yeah, he told, I swear, he told me over dinner, 800 metres. I said, I trust Uz. Because Uz Rukti translated this book into German. It was a massive job. I consider Urs one of the great academics and knowledgeable people of this massive work. So when I said it's 800 metres north of Damascus Gate and it was Urs, Martin said, OK. So we bought a tourist map, a genuine tourist map. We scribed an 800 metre arc because there was a little um, distance legend on the bottom corner. And so we knew that the tomb was on this 800 metre arc. We knew it was in the north, which the arc was. We knew that the rock face faced east. And guess what? Four hours later, I find myself standing on the roof of a rock ledge and Martin's down below on the footpath and he looks up and there is what we would describe as a cave. But then I realised no ordinary cave because... The rock ledge was carved and that's the compass pointing east. All right. 99 square feet. I went into the tomb and measured it. And we took a whole lot of measurements but the most important one is 99 square feet, which is 10 feet by 10 feet, which matches exactly the dimensions in the book. So I ask you, what are the chances of finding a tomb in the heart of Jerusalem facing exactly the right direction, having exactly the dimensions we were looking for within four hours? So, this is what we found. There is the cut rot ledge, entrance into the tomb. Martin and I were speechless for four hours. We sat in the gardens of a nearby hotel called the American Colony and just were speechless because now we had to work out what are we going to do. There's another... Another photo, you'll get a sense of it from this photo. 
You can see it was covered in rubbish. In fact, there was an old toilet cistern inside the tomb and I was so offended by it, I was about to throw it out. And Martin said, Steve, that's what's protecting it. Leave it. Leave all the rubbish around it. Leave it until we can work out what we're going to do. There we go, yours truly. Okay, we came back to Australia. We appointed some lawyers, Arnold Block Liebler here in Melbourne, and they suggested we appoint Herzog Fox Naiman in Tel Aviv. This is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. I made two reports, one on the home, all our logic, or my logic, rationale, reasoning, about why I think the house in Nazareth is the holy home. Then I wrote a second report, the discovery of the tomb in Jerusalem and all our references. Then I made a brief summary in a registered envelope and I sent myself 300 registered letters dated 2005. This is a legal document. Then I sealed all the reports, the larger reports, in registered envelopes, 2005. They contain all the information of the two discoveries. Okay, I didn't realise how fortuitous that was a decade later. I just thought I'd do this for fun. I laid out 300 envelopes or a couple of hundred and turned it into a bit of a, an artwork. There's the piles. That's the report on Nazareth. The Friendship Discovery, or Friendship Garden, which it soon became. Registered and sealed. In 2005, a meeting was called between Herzog Fox Naiman, Jerusalem's top archaeologist, Professor Mir Bendov. In attendance at the site was Martin McBurney and Joanna Kajawa, who was recording, making notes about the event. Professor Mir Bendov walks up to the tomb, leans in, dates it within 30 seconds. He said, this is phenomenal. He said, we have walked over every inch of this, of Jerusalem for years and we've never ever discovered it. It's like it was invisible, it was, it was hidden. He said, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. He said, you know that only a handful were ever made because they're so expensive to build and it takes a lot of skill. Also in attendance was a representative from HFN, Yakov Brandt, property director. Knows all about properties in Jerusalem. So they're the material discoveries. And you think that's interesting. Wait till session two. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you. Thank you.